So I had a, uh, a case where somebody was, was buying a, a second home, which was going to be their main home, for £650,000. Uh, and the SDLT that uh, she was paying was £42,000. Uh, and uh, she had to pay the additional 3%. So if you, if you own an existing property and you buy a second or additional property, you, you, you should know that you've got to pay extra 3% SDLT. Yeah? If you sell your first one, within three years of, of buying your second one, you can get the 3% back from HMRC. So she, she had to pay the extra 3% because she still had her first one, which she was going to sell at some point in the future. So by chance, in fact, she was at one of these events this is going back about, I don't know, two and a half years. <coughs> she told me she had a granny annex to the side of her property, which is interesting for SDLT purposes. Because if you have a granny annex, and it has a separate entrance, a separate bathroom, and a separate kitchen, you claim something called multiple dwellings relief, which to keep it really simple means you're buying two properties and not one. So that, even though the properties on one title, as long as you have a separate unit with a separate entrance, separate kitchen, and a separate uh, bedroom, bathroom, you claim MDR, which means you can reduce your uh, SDLT. So we, we worked that out, and our SDLT in the two properties was going to be 12,500 pounds versus the previous figure, which is a lot higher. I, um, I actually brought uh, sort of two neighboring properties, that, but they were on one title deed. So there was seven flats. Now I can't remember whether I would have whether I would have paid um, stamp duty or not. But would I have been able to qualify if they were under one title with seven flats in it? It could be one title, it could be more than one title by the way. Yeah. If it's one title you're fine. So you've got three options. You either pay the standard rate, so you work out the figures. Yeah. Then you can then your second option is MDR, okay? Which is gonna significantly reduce your SDLT, depending on the values. Yeah. And you have a third option, which is because you're buying six or more properties at the same time, you can claim, no, you can pay non-residential rates of SDLT, which could be a lot lower. Yeah, so you've got, and you work out which one works best for you, and you use that. Do we have any lawyers in the house by any chance? No, we have one. Yes. Which area of the law do you specialize in? I do immigration and family. Okay. Good, in that case we like you. Uh, but there are uh, plenty out there who do property. And if you read their terms and conditions, it makes it very clear because the SRA, uh, which is their regulatory body, does not allow solicitors to offer tax advice. They're not allowed to do it, okay, because their PI cover would go through the roof. Yet, when you buy a property, who files your SDLT return? Lawyer. Lawyer. Okay, there's no chance at all you can get them to get somebody else to file it. They just won't do it. I've tried many times. They won't do it. So, so they file your SDLT return. And who works out your SDLT? Sister. Sister. For most people out there, Cindy. Okay? And if it's a simple case, you're buying a property, second property, you're keeping the first one, then you, obviously this here applies. Yes, can John make a retrospective claim? We're going to come to that in a second. Uh, and your solicitor will work out this calculation. Anybody can do this. It's on HMRC's website. You punch in the facts, they'll give you this. The, the challenge is, and our, we do a lot of this, but we probably do on 15, 20 SDLT cases every single month where we're saving people SDLT. It, where, where, where you get MDR and other, uh, there's about 15, different, 15 to 20 different SDLT reliefs that lawyers don't really know about or don't understand, uh, they'll file your, your tax, tax return, or SDLT return, and quite often we found they haven't done it as they ought to have done it. Now the good thing about lawyers is this, if you go to your tax advisor and say, can you work out the SDLT and give me advice, and they give it to you in writing, and you give that to your lawyer, they'll happily follow the advice, because that gets their neck off the line, they've got something in writing, they follow that. If, a, if your SDLT return has been filed, when did you buy these properties? Um, I bought them 20, 2021. They are completed in 2021, January. Okay. So in the first 12 months, you can change your return. It's really easy. If it's been longer than a year, but less than four years, so up to four years, 
you can still make a change, but it's harder to do. Because then you've got to demonstrate why it took you more than 12 months yeah. to pick it up. So we've done both, but 12 months is a lot easier. There's no questions asked. They'll process it. More than 12 months, it takes longer. But it could, it could still be worth doing in your particular case. So if you want to drop me an email, I'll happily, I'll happily have a look at that. Cool. But you can see here a huge saving in SDLT, and her solicitor hadn't picked this up. So if you're buying a property with a granny annex or more than one property, make sure you do the calculations. If you're buying six or more together, then there's three to do. So that's just a, a side note for you. The most common question I get asked is, what expenses can I claim? OK? Does anybody want to yeah, hazard a guess or tell me what expenses you can claim in your business without looking at the slide? So I've given the game away, by the way. <laughs> anybody? What can you or what can't you claim? Anything to do with running the business. Anything to do with running the business. Yeah, pretty much. So that's not the answer people want, by the way. OK, because most people want me to give them a list of 643 different things you can claim. <laughs> but the answer is you can claim anything. The only test you have to meet, it's a very simple test, is the one on the, on the, on the or first <coughs> bullet point. Is it wholly and exclusively for the purpose of your business? So is that the main reason that you spend the money? If it is, you can claim the cost. Simple as that. No ifs, buts, and, or whatever. So sometimes people ask me, I am going to buy some property. Who's got sent to that property in Spain? Was it you over there? So somebody may say, I'm, I'm going to Spain to buy a property. Uh, and I'm going to meet three or four agents. I'm going to have a look around. I'm spending a week there. But I intend to stay two weeks. So the second week, I'm going to spend there and just enjoy and have a holiday. Can you claim the travel and the hotel costs? We're asking you because you're the expert in the room because you've got one more property than everybody else internationally that I know about. Um, part of them, not all of them. OK. Which part can we claim? So I'd say it depends on the proportions. So if it's kind of one week for business. Accountants, are gonna lo accountants love you, by the way, because when you say it depends, that's our favorite answer, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I'd say it depends, yeah, proportion of time you spent on business versus time you spent on holiday. So you spent 14 nights there, seven nights was to look for a property, yeah. seven nights wasn't. So you paid for your flight yeah. and your accommodation. Can you claim all your flight or half your flight? I'd say half. You'd say half. And can you claim all your 14 nights or half the 14 nights? Again, I'd say half. OK. Who agrees with our friend over here that for your flight, you, you can only claim half? <laughs> you have a friend in Cindy, by the way, and that's because she's nice. <laughs> oh, oh, and Cindy, do you have a question, by the way? No. Okay. I'm just, uh, just okay. And who thinks you can claim the entire flight? They're right, by the way. Because your flight was to get you there, and had you not spent the extra seven nights, you'd have still paid for the flight. So it's some cost. So you claim all your flight, and only for the first, uh, first seven nights, you can claim the expense. Second seven nights, you don't. Yeah? Uh, so you could, you could do that. Now, again, I don't want to go too technical here. Sometimes you may have an expense which has a dual purpose. So there's two purposes, OK? And to make it really simple is you may buy some a form of clothing as uniform. So you're buying it for two reasons, OK? One is for work purposes, and the other one is obviously uh, to look decent. Uh, but, but if the main purpose is to buy it for business purposes, you're OK. If the main purpose is to look decent, then you can't. So sometimes an, an expense has a dual purpose, and you've got to figure out, OK, which, which purpose is it, personal or business? So to keep it really simple for you, is it wholly and exclusively for the purpose of the business? If it is, you can claim it. And we're going to talk a bit about training costs, because that's a common question people ask. Really quick question. Uh, if you're starting off and you're using the equipment or you know, the IT equipment, anything that you've already got, it's your personal sort of stuff for the business, how'd that work? Um, you know, so you had to, you know, anything really, could you put, claim that towards your business? We're talking about a house, we're talking about a car, we are, we're talking about, talking about a yacht, a plane, a helicopter. If you're using a computer or you're using your car to travel. Um, you know, to see properties, um, stationary, 
Yeah, but if you like that. Okay. So you would introduce those to, to the business and claim them as a cost. So let's say you bought a computer a year ago worth a thousand pounds. It's now worth 50 quid. Uh, no, so it, 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 it's worth 300 pounds. Uh, you could introduce that to the business, and the business pays you 300 pounds for your laptop. Yeah? Same with st stationery and other items. Cars are a bit more complicated and different. I'm going to talk about them probably after the break. Yeah. Uh, Chad, aren't there some benefits of capital equipment at the moment where they pay you like a bonus, like a 25% uplift? So, if you buy some IT equipment, for example, I think there's some schemes where you can actually claim or offset 125% rather than 100% of that. There's capital allowances, yeah. which depending on what you do, so, so, so if you're R&D, you get a, a 130%. Uh, if you're if it's standard uh, capital allowances, then you, you can claim 100% in the first year. So, it's, so you've got that. One. But there's no 25% additional uplift uh, per se. Only on R and D. Only on R and D. So, if she bought the computer for R and D purposes, she could claim it. If she can claim it, it it's part of the R and D costs. Yeah. If you buy a property <coughs> which is contaminated, so Japanese knotweed is common. Asbestos is common, okay, and you have a limited company, and you're a property trader, so you're doing flips, commercial conversions, okay, new builds, and you're selling them. Uh, and let's say you buy a petrol station that usually has a lot of contamination. You can claim 100% of the cost, obviously, because you've, you've spent them, but you can claim an extra 50% on top of that. So you get 150% of your costs back, okay, uh, from HMRC to fix the area that you've fixed. I bought a property at auction with uh, Japanese knotweed, but I only found out because I bought blind, like after I got it. So um, with regards to it, would I be able to go back even though I paid for the Japanese knotweed to be eradicated or? You can go back up to two years, but you have, you must have, you, you should have bought the property in a limited company. Did you buy it in your own name or a company? No, I, well, at the time I bought it in my, in a company and then transferred it, uh, bought it in my own name and then transferred it into a company. Straight away or after a, a period? Uh, straight away, because I, I, I sort of, um, I think, I think it was a period actually, it might have been. And who paid the cost, you or the company? Uh, I'll ask the question now. Um, I think I would have paid for it personally. Then you can't claim it. Unless you paid for it personally when the property was transferred over to the company. I don't think so. Yeah. And even then, you have to be a property trader. So if you bought that property and you fixed it up and you made, turned it into a buy to let, you can't claim it. If you, if you do a, a flip, a commercial conversion, whatever, then you can. Okay, but it's good to know for the future. Mm. Um. Yeah. And HMRC or the government are really nice. They want to make stuff really simple for you, so we've got this whole department uh, which simplifies tax, by the way, okay? Uh, and the, what they've said is people really struggle out there with accounts and tax, and what we're going to do is we're going to be really nice to you. If you, if you earn a thousand pounds in property income a year, then don't pay any tax on it, okay? It's really generous, isn't it, Cindy? Thousand pounds. <laughs> Who earns a thousand pounds from gross rents from property in a year? Yeah. Maybe Hull, John? Hull? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Is that yeah. on um, turnover or net? Turnover. Okay. Do you know? So hardly worth doing, isn't it? And they've got something, something similar called uh, for general businesses. Again, a thousand pounds. I mean, who's going to run a business and want to make a thousand pounds a year? When you say joint property owners, what do you mean? Two or more people. But if it's a limited company? That's different. This is just in, 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 in your name, that, that's right, yeah. This is to make tax simple for people out there, okay? Usually, when they make tax simple, then they're making it more complex, yeah? Like the flat rate scheme is, is there to make it simple. It's more complicated, it really is, but there you go. Okay, let me give you another example of a, for SDLT, because the SDLT is quite big. I had a guy who was buying two properties, uh, and it was a million pounds per property, uh, somewhere in South London, I think it was Wandsworth, uh, and uh, one property had been empty for three years, other one empty for two years. So when a, when a property has been empty for a while, 
what do you think may happen to a property? Deteriorates. Deteriorates, OK. Uh, and if that happens, there may be an opportunity for you, by the way. So his SDLT bill on those two properties, again, this was about 18 months ago, was £221,000. After having done all, all the calculations, and you can't see because I'll be green there, uh, it came from 221 to £90,000. So he saved £131,000 in stamp duty land tax. So you've got something out, out there, uh, which is called when you buy a property which is uninhabitable. Now, for mortgage purposes, by the way, uh, what qualifies as being uninhabitable? Anybody know? No kitchen and no bathroom. No kitchen and no bathroom, OK? Unfortunately, that doesn't apply for SDLT purposes. SDLT purposes, the threshold is higher. So if you have a roof missing, you, then you don't pay the standard rates of SDLT, and you don't pay the additional 3%. OK? So, sorry to interrupt. So we were looking at buying three flats, and this started negotiations with the, the owner. And then there was a fire in the adjacent building that actually his flats have now been wiped out with water damage, 90% water damage and 20% fire and smoke damage. Would that be subject to the SDRT now? It will be, but you're going to pay a lot less. Okay. A lot less. So it's still worth pursuing. Yeah, and, and you won't pay the additional 3% either. But we're, really? buying, we're buying the business, though, not the assets. We're buying the business. We're taking these shares. Well. Is that this question over here? Yeah. <laughs> OK, we'll cover it after the break, after the break, and we'll, we'll talk about but that. It also means, because one of the things that we were struggling on is making money after the cost of the SDLT, because, of course, you've got to factor that into your yeah. percentage yeah. return yeah. rate. Yeah, so we'll talk about that after the break. Okay. How about the commercial property, like a pub, just by end? Yeah, that's you've just got to mm -hmm. pay, pay the normal rate. So the first 150 no SDLT, next 100,000, two percent. Anything over 250, five percent. Yeah, there's no savings on that. We just agreed to purchase on a, a one-bedroom flat, which is going to just for a, a basic BTL. Um, the it's been broken into; literally everything was ripped out. Uh, so there's just no kitchen, no bathroom. It's an empty hut, which is great because there's no uh, sort of. Uh, it's taped as a job. Yeah, there's, there's no strip out costs. But the fact is that's now uninhabitable. Mm -hmm. But you said that the kitchens don't count towards SDLT. So we still have to pay the stamp duty on that property, do we? You may not. You may not. So if a roof is so, so for a property to be uninhabitable, it should not be classed as a house. How do we establish that? If a roof's missing, it's not a house. OK? If it's got asbestos, which some properties do have, by the way, mm. it's not a house, or, or it's not fit for human habitation. If you've got electrical wires sticking out and it makes it dangerous, and you've got pipe work sticking out, okay, from the floorboards and etc., uh, etc., et it makes it uninhabitable. So sometimes one thing alone might not be enough, but as you look around the property, okay, there's two or three things. Uh, which means it's uninhabitable. And like I said to you earlier, we're doing about 20 cases a month on this every single month. You need a photographic record or something for that? Ideally. Ideally. Because otherwise, uh, I mean, they don't ask for that. Uh, we, we've never had them ask for that. Uh, but remember, it's process now, check later. So they might do. So if you've got something which demonstrates that, yeah. it'd be good. If you don't, if you speak to the agent who took the photos when you bought the property, they could only stick the two or three nice ones, don't they, on the website, but they have some others. They might have some which you, which you could use. Yeah? Uh, but there's a huge amount of SDLT to be saved if a property is classed as uninhabitable right now. Now, I can assure you what they're going to do is they'll change those rules. Because right now, you've got people out there, and maybe you've seen on Facebook, who will say to you, you've overpaid the SDLT or whatever, we can save you money. Uh, and the minute you have people out there who are not tax experts, who start marketing tax services, how it's happened in the past as well, by the way, that's when, they, when the government come in and they change the rules. Because the number one thing that HMRC hate, not the government so much, HMRC hate, is tax advisors marketing tax services and saying, we can assure you you'll pay less, DS, uh, less SDLT, less capital gains tax, less corporation tax. So this used to happen four, four or five years ago and longer. 
where you had tax avoidance schemes, where people were saying, if you do enter into a particular transaction, you're not going to pay any tax. And then HMRC came down heavy on that with the government. Same thing happening now with SDLT. A lot of people on Facebook who aren't SDLT experts, by the way, okay, then they'll come to people like me, uh, are marketing services, charging people, okay, and saying you can get a, a SDLT back, mainly on this particular thing here. Thanks for watching and I hope you enjoyed this video. If you have, by the way, make sure you click like, subscribe and post a comment uh, because that tells me that you're engaging and you're finding the content useful. And if you like this video, make sure you check out this video here because it's the next stage in terms of your learning and development.